Hi, it's Ross Pluskin here from the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. You know, since I was a little pipsqueak, I've been to a lot of public aquariums. I've been to a lot of private aquariums, public aquariums, all kinds of aquariums meant for display and wonder and sensation. There are a few places on the planet that even begin to scratch, especially when it comes to reef fish diversity, especially when it comes to tang diversity. The collection that we have not only being preserved and thriving, but working and operating here at the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. We're gonna be continuing our running series today, addressing uh, the Acan 30, the wonderful family commonly known as the surgeon fish or the tangs. And we're gonna be continuing our series with a series of spotlights into the various tribes of tangs and how these various tribes of tangs operate within here at our facility and how we take advantage of the many diverse powers, forms, functions, and personalities that the various tribes of the Aitken 30 have to offer. They say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes the entire world and ocean of tribes to clean and feed a coral farm. So without further ado, let's begin our exploration into a world of diversity from the Persian Gulf all the way to offshore here in Florida into the world of diversity of the Acan 30. So we'll be starting off with our first subfamily of the Acan 30, the Nasini. So the Nasini refers to the Nasos, the unicorn fish. These are wonderfully characterized by the majestic individual specimen you see behind me, which is Naso elegans, the blonde Naso fish. These are far more elongated than the rest of the tangs we'll be talking about and seeing here on our tour of the farm today. They are long, elongate fish that are responsible for maneuvering long distances of open water, transporting themselves in larger groups from forage ground to forage ground, reef to reef, flat to flat, et cetera, et cetera. So what we take advantage of that ability here at the farm is we need to be able to have cleanup crew, really ravenous herbivores, which these nasos certainly are, uh, be, to be able to operate in very, very, very big and high flow environments. So by being able to take advantage of their pelagic lifestyle, we are able to take advantage and are very fortunate to have a variety of different naso species working for us to keep our high flow Acropora gardens clean. So the blonde naso fish, naso elegans you see behind me, but in our system uh, RD, we also have naso lateralis. We have the orange spine naso fish, and in the, the tank of Sherwood to the right of me, we have Naso bevorostris, the short horn uh, unicorn fish. And we also have uh, over in Belafonte's display and throughout the farm, Naso vlamingi, the big nose unicorn fish. A few quick things about this family before we move on. Several species, including the blonde Naso and the orange spine Naso, do not have the ability to retract their peduncle spine like many of the other surgeon fish family. So as a result, this translates to a degree into their temperament and behavior, where they constantly have these outward spines that are always on display. These fish aren't necessarily quick to use those spines as a weapon and as aggressive force, but in return, they are not to be messed with at all as they constantly have weaponry out in the open. Um, what's very fortunate with us is that when many of these fish are imported from the wild, these outward spines have to be trimmed so that they do not tear at the packaging and cause them to perish while they're being transported. Because we've had these naso species in our tanks for such long periods of time, they've had the luxury of maneuvering around these big open systems and have produced long charismatic spines that are on display here in a way that they simply aren't in many other facilities where they've been more recently uh, shipped in. Something else to mention about the unicorn fish is that because they grow to such a massive size, they require very large, long, high flow aquariums that really can be, uh, are very difficult to simulate in facilities other than ours, where we by necessity have these long uh, Acropora raceway gardens. And in return, in their native range, many of these species reach such big sizes that they're co uh, common game fish species for spear fishermen and can actually uh, make a pretty good meal. I've had some of these unicorn fish species myself and they're actually pretty darn tasty. It's because they reach such large sizes, often exceeding a few feet in length, that many of the naso fish species are simply not compatible with the average home aquaria. 
even here at the farm, and this applies to our other tang species as well, their maximum size is not necessarily something which is very useful or accommodatable here at our facility. We want young, relatively young fish that are ravenous, willing to grow up on a variety of different forages so they can keep our tanks clean. But once they hit a certain size, very often we will sell them to larger collections and larger aquariums that can more adequately fit their needs as an adult organism. If we allowed many of these unicorn fish to exceed and reach close to their maximum size in our systems, their grazing potential would quickly uh, outstrip usefulness and enter the realm of destructiveness. So without further ado, we'll be moving on from the naso into the subfamily of the Acanthurini. So moving on, we've gone through the naso subfamily and the tribe of the nasini. So let's move on to the next subfamily, the Acanthurini. This contains all the other tribes of the surgeon fish. So here's a fantastic and very unique, incredible specimen that we have here at Top Shelf. Even people that are, are big into fish come in here. And this is one of the fish where they're like, oh, you have a Sohal in one of your acro tanks? This is Sohal tanks from the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. This is a fish which, again, can exceed a few feet in length at its maximum size. It can be in, caught by sport fishermen, but, but here this individual is getting the opportunity to be a wonderful ambassador for its species. This is a fish which the average hobbyist will likely not see, let alone will likely not own. And yet when they come here to tour top shelf aquatics or even come here to just do a little shopping, they can see that even one of the most aggressive reputation fish can with the right context, the right work, the right staff, the right environment, the right environmental settings can cooperate in not being something that's a really destructive fish that will just destroy everything around it, stress out and perish, but here operating towards the greater beauty and even production of wonderful aquaculture acropora. And this applies to so many more of the Akin Thurini tribe members that we have here at the farm. Members like the Sohal, members like the Achilles Tang, Acanthurus Achilles, which also operates as an incredible powerhouse of herbivore grazing pressure, as in its wild range in the Indo-Pacific, it's constantly receiving near colossal wave action. So it's not bothered at all when it's faced with a tremendous power coming out of our power heads that we need to keep our acroporas happy. Uh, it can still operate and maneuver absolutely fine. We don't need to only uh, depend on fish from the Arabian Peninsula and the Indo-Pacific. We have things like Acanthurus coriolis, the Atlantic blue tang here, which is native right off here, the coast of Florida. Another wonderful fish species that we can see the Acanthurus collectively as a whole. We've gone from the naso tang, very elongate shape, and we're slowly getting more compressed as the Acanthurus are a little bit more high flow they can still transport distances between pasture grounds. We can see that they're a lot more specialized in operating within that structure than necessarily the more pelagic surface level nasotanks are. We have many, many, many Acanthurus species here at the farm. Triostegus, the convict sur uh, surgeon fish, you'll see operating in our OG SPS tank. We also have Acanthurus oliviasis, the orange shoulder tang. Again, a wonderful species that represents a little bit more of the elongated side of the Acanthurini tribe. So overall, to summarize the Acanthurini, they represent a massive chunk of the surgeon fish diversity currently present in the hobby and currently operating in a functional way here at coral farms such as ours. <laughs> Continuing our description of the tribe Acanthurini, it actually contains two different genera. The first is the Acanthurus, which we've just briefly described. The second is the Tinochadius. This is an interesting derivation in all of the surgeon fish we've seen up until this point. The naso fish is very elongated. It has almost a perfectly centerward facing mouth, if not slightly upward facing. The Acanthurus, again, very round, but again, centered, center facing mouth. Uh, if not a little upward facing. The Tinochadius, the bristle toots, they are a little bit more unique because they have a slightly downward facing mouth and they compromise a lot more on having a lot more of a compressed shape as a whole than their Acanthurus and certainly the more elongated nasos. So 
A very important member is the Tino Chadius Tumini that you see behind me and operating in the school to the left of me in the other tank of Belafonte. This is a great tang because it's smaller, can be kept at slightly higher densities, and reflects that downward facing mouth grazing action, where again, we can see because we have more and more diversity of different tangs operating here at the farm, we have different mouth shapes being able to access and graze on different forage, and then different body shapes and muscle structures to be able to navigate that mouth and that grazing pressure to different targets. Other members of the Tinochadius that are very important here at the farm are Tinochadius truncatus, such as our yellow eye coal tangs, or even our Tinochadius striatus, our striped coal tang that we keep uh, over in Sherwood. So we're going to be moving out of the tribe Acanthurini now and moving on to a more unique tribe that only has a single living member. Now that we've covered the Acanthurini and that members of that tribe, we'll talk about the one member, one tribe that we don't have here at the farm. It's simply because most of the members of this tribe get pretty big, they're pelagic tanks for the most part, they're relatively aggressive, and for the most part, uh, they're not ubiquitously present in the hobby. They're relatively rare and a little bit more of a niche fish to keep. This is members of the Prionurini, the Prionurus and its relatives. So these are the doctor fish, the sawtails. We'll briefly describe them, but if we have a member, an individual that shows up in retail, of the retail store, we'll be sure to do a species spotlight on it. But the Prionurini, the only members we do not have present working for us at the farm. Now we'll move on to the Zebra Somini tribe, which the first genus member of the Zebra Somini is the only surviving member of its genus. This is the Paraacanthurus, specifically Paraacanthurus hepatis. You all know it as the blue hippo tang. Now, this is a wonderfully unique individual species because it, it represents a wonderful transition from the Acanthurus and the Nasos transitioning towards some of the trends that we'll see in the other Zebrasoma tangs. They are relatively elongated, but we see a wonderful emphasis placed on their pectoral fins as well, where they have kind of this fusion of the two general body shapes, where we have the ability to move in between reefs, but also a great emphasis on being able to tuck in to the various structures of reefs, and being able to take shelter at night. So the Paraacanthurus, the blue hippo tang, a very, very unique, only living member of its genus. So the second major member of the Zebrasomini are the Zebrasoma genus. This represents all manner of tangs that are extremely valuable and recognizable in the reef aquarium hobby today and that form a huge functional role here at the farm, uh, especially when operating in places that are too small for their bigger naso and acanthurus cousins to operate in. So a few bigger examples you see behind me in this display tank, there is Zebrasoma desjardini, the red sea sailfin tang that's going by me right now. This is a wonderful example of how diverse this tribe is, where we have a sailfin from the Red Sea, and we also have, in back of Garrett there, we have uh, Zebrasoma uh, velifer. So that is the Indo-Pacific sailfin. Very similar in appearance, yet they are so successful, they were able to colonize vastly different bodies of water and eventually become different species. Now, why are the Zebrasoma so adept at being able to conquer uh, even when they're not the biggest and they're a lot more stout compared to the other tang species. Well, it's because of that smaller, more compressed shape that they're able to feed more efficiently inside more localized areas of coral reef habitats. Think the small grazing activity of Zebrasoma scopus or Zebrasoma flavescens, the scopus and the yellow tangs that we have here very small, compressed, and they have a very narrow pennate mouth that they can use to worm their way into various different crevices and access all kinds of forage that big, larger, bulkier tangs and other herbivores cannot access. So the Zebrasoma has many other wonderful representative species here at our farm, including another incredibly charismatic and hallmark species that we see behind me, the Zebrasoma xanthorum, the purple tang. So the Zebrasoma, a lot more compressed and narrow mouth as a whole compared to their cent center facing, longer cousins, the Nasos, downward facing cousins, the Tinochadius, and the like. Tangs and the surgeon fish have conquered 
and thrived in tropical oceans the world over, from the Persian Gulf all the way to the Indo-Pacific through the Japanese Ryukyu Islands, through Hawaii, and even off here at the coast of Florida. This power of being able to spread and colonize throughout all these different water bodies has made their family very diverse, both in body shape, size, temperament, colors, gut microbiomes, ability to feed, ability to get to different pastures. And here at Top Shelf, we see that diversity as power and something to be harnessed. And that's why we make an active effort to collect and house successfully as many different species of tangs as we can from as many different tribes so that we can not only access all their different muscle types and strategies to be able to access and clean our various areas that we need them to clean, to access their different mouth parts that they can able to feed and graze on different forms of algae where they are and what needs to be cleaned, and also their internal gut microbiota. That which makes them them on a very intimate and genetic level, both as a species, tribe, and an individual. By harnessing that diversity, by recognizing the diversity, of everything from our nasos through our acanthurids, all the way down to our zebra somids, that is how we recognize, celebrate, and encourage everyone to uh, want to keep this wonderful family of fish species alive and working here as our cleaning cavalry at the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm. So if you like that video and you wanna see more, you wanna see a certain species of tang spotlighted, or if you wanna see our next video uh, about the grazing and feeding gastrointestinal activity of tangs, like, subscribe, feed the algorithm like you would a hungry tang slurping down a piece of nori. We'll see you next time.